Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu Alaikum, everyone. Uh, welcome to week 15 of your course, uh, Creativity and Innovation. Uh, for this uh, video lecture, I'll be talking to you about uh, the concept of innovation models, uh, along with some uh, examples associated with uh, Pakistan, uh, specifically with an emphasis on uh, CPEC, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. Uh, and I will also be reviewing uh, Pakistan's uh, science, technology, and innovation policy. Uh, uh, if you recall, uh, I had shared some materials uh, relevant to these topics uh, previously or the last week. Uh, and you were required to uh, review or uh, read these uh, handouts. So for week 15, uh, I'll be covering those handouts along with some further material uh, specific to week 15 only. Uh, this topic connects with your outline or syllabus uh, schedule. If you see here, week 14 and 15 on the left side of your screen. Uh, so for these two weeks, uh, Previous week was week 14. I had shared some handouts associated with innovation models. And uh, besides that, uh, there is a handout uh, on uh, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor and Pakistan's National Innovation System. And uh, followed by that, there is Pakistan's National Science Innovation and Technology Policy. Uh, during week 14, I have already uh, assigned some information or provided some details with regards to your 20 marks assignment, which is the personal statement and uh, your CV or resume. As you might recall, uh, uh, since the closure of campus, some amendments or uh, changes were incorporated to this assignment and I had shared or informed you about those changes uh, at the very start of my online lectures. Uh, and you are supposed to accordingly complete this assignment by the designated deadline. <laughs> so let me take you to the first handout. This is about innovation models. Now, uh, as far as management literature is concerned, within the field of innovation and innovation management, a lot of academic work uh, has uh, been put into uh, how to understand and how to practice uh, innovation at different uh, levels of an economy or different levels within the economy of a country or a region. Uh, Similarly, besides academic, uh, academicians or academics, uh, different organizations, practitioners, businesses, corporations, even non-profit organizations, uh, international agencies, governments uh, have been uh, pursuing uh, uh, different ways and means in terms of how to understand uh, and uh, how to implement uh, different aspects of innovation with regards to their economy or uh, the different uh, uh, dimensions of the uh, economic development and so on and so forth. So innovation models is one such concept which is basically uh, meant to help understand the different approaches uh, regarding how to innovate, how to improve. Uh, and uh, some of the innovation models that I'm going to be talking about are provided in this handout. Uh, Please note down that these different innovation models uh, are, you can conceptualize them in different ways. For example, from a research perspective or academic perspective, these are theories or frameworks or approaches to how uh, we can uh, comprehend and uh, implement innovation. From a practitioner's perspective, uh, these models are help, meant to help uh, industries, sectors, organizations, companies, uh, government decision-making bodies, 
these models are supposed to help them in terms of designing or developing strategies uh, and uh, ways and means of approaching their business or ways and means of uh, implementing different aspects of their business with regards to uh, innovation. So some of the famous innovation models are the ones which are popular. One is, the first one is the concept of inno incremental innovation. Uh, you might recall that at the very start of the semester, I had shared some information about uh, uh, four major types of this innovation, marketing or market innovation uh, and organizational innovation. Later on, these terms have slightly been changed. For example, product and process innovation are the same, but for marketing innovation, there has been uh, a concept uh, which is uh, uh, called uh, paradigm innovation. And also there has been some amendments to the concept of uh, organizational innovation. So uh, what is important to remember is that these four broader or basic types of innovation have been discussed in detail in your uh, uh, one of the books, Innovation Management, and I had shared a copy of this book at the very start of the semester with you. Uh, so connected with that is the concept of innovation models. So incremental innovation, very simply, uh, obviously you can read the uh, details here when you are reviewing or reading this handout, but in incremental innovation is, as the term suggests, uh, these are small improvements or upgrades. So if you look at this, uh, uh, point here. These are small improvements or upgrades to a company's existing products, services, processes, or methods, or ways, ways of doing things. So, for example, if a company uh, manufactures uh, television sets uh, for household uh, consumption, for example, as a home appliance, and if the company comes up with a new model where uh, it introduces a small design change. For example, a certain technology within the television which is used is upgraded. <clears throat> or for example, the shape of the television is slightly changed. Similarly, if you look at the example of uh, cars or automotives, um, let's say if you look at the car Honda Civic. So if Honda Civic every year comes up with some minor amendments to its uh, previous year's models, so for example, they might change the shape of the headlights, they might change the shape of the uh, front bumper, <clears throat> they might change the shape of the door or handle. So these are uh, small improvements or upgrades and such innovations are called incremental innovations. And these are very common uh, across different industries. Uh, second one is radical innovation. <clears throat> As the term suggests, Radical means something which is uh, fundamental in nature, which is uh, big, which is uh, going to change things significantly. So if you look at the definition here, it says that disrupt uh, radical innovation, by the way, it is also called disruptive innovation. So radical or disruptive innovation is an innovation that creates new market and value network and eventually disrupts an existing market and value network, uh, displacing uh, um, established market leading firms or players and the, the different established products and different company alliances or, as well. So as the term suggests, radical innovation is something which will, you know, change the rules of the industry or it will significantly impact the way things have been happening within a sector or industry uh, or within a certain uh, economy or region. So for example, some of the very uh, crucial disruptive technologies have been uh, associated with uh, computers and softwares, etc. So, uh, for example, uh, the, the first computer, personal computer, was a, was a major disruption because it, you know, significantly changed the, the way we looked at things around us, the way organizations worked, the way businesses functioned. Similarly, when the internet came, internet is considered to be a major disruption. Uh, which you know significantly changed uh, everything. So such technologies as in the shape of internet, in the shape of computers, in the shape of uh, mobile phone devices, smartphone, etc. These are major disruptions. 
usually the literature in research or disruptive or radical innovation suggests that uh, most of these disruptions have to do with uh, simplification of technology. So what I mean to say is that disruptive innovations are mostly achieved as a result of uh, uh, people developing this ability to simplify existing use of technology or existing application of technology to such an extent that it you know uh, has a significant impact on the overall market and it results in significant uh, cost reductions for businesses or it results in significant changes to existing products in such a way that the rules of the business or the way the businesses or sector uh, companies or stakeholders function that completely transforms uh, in the recent scenario uh, coronavirus or covid is uh, uh, a disruption i will not say that it's a disruptive innovation because it's uh, it has nothing to do with innovation but it ha it is a ma massive disruption and you can very well uh, assume from this that uh, it has resulted in uh, uh, creation of disruptive innovations uh, or radical innovations for example just look at the way your online semester is uh, going on so for example the way universities or institutions or schools have been approaching their uh, functioning or uh, their work has transformed at least temporarily but many uh, analysts believe that this disruption or this radical change in terms of how universities uh, function or how colleges or schools function this is going to stay uh, and as a result if a university as a result of the disruption of uh, COVID-19, if it changes its overall approach towards uh, instruction or teaching, then in this case, we will call it radical innovation or disruptive innovation. Moving further, the next point is high-tech innovation. So what is high-tech innovation? As the term suggests, these are innovations characterized by uh, use of highly sophisticated technologies. Uh, However, one very important point to remember is that how is high tech innovation different from radical innovation? Now, please remember that when we use the term radical, it means uh, simplification, as I mentioned, simplification of the technology. It means uh, simplification of the technology to such, a, such an extent that it results in massive cost reductions for the company or it results in massive uh, price reduction for the customer. Uh, it results in massive value addition or benefits uh, for the customer. It makes the customer or user's job uh, or uh, the uh, functioning of the product so easy and so, so convenient that it completely uh, makes the existing product uh, which is available in the market, it makes it completely obsolete or, you know, it completely changes the way the, the business sector works or the products function or the way consumers use the products. As far as high tech innovation is concerned, this results, this connects with use of highly advanced technologies. So these highly advanced technologies may not necessarily be simple. For example, uh, in, the, in the pharmaceutical sector, uh, there has been a lot of uh, focus on uh, research and development, R&D. And as a result, uh, some of the world's leading pharmaceutical companies are coming up with highly sophisticated, highly advanced drugs and medical equipments, testing equipments, hospital equipments, uh, which are, you know, I'm not saying that these equipments are manufactured by pharmaceutical. What I'm saying is that this whole health sector, which includes pharmaceutical firms, which includes technology firms, uh, technology firms, especially those which uh, specialize in developing, designing, and producing high-tech uh, equipment associated with uh, different kinds of uh, uh, ailments or diseases. So uh, these sectors are characterized by uh, use of high technology. Similarly, in the case of, for example, the defense industry, uh, some of the world's leading firms which produce highly sophisticated, uh, highly lethal weapons, aircrafts, uh, warships, etc. These are also characterized or these are also uh, high-tech sectors or high-tech high innovation is taking place. Uh, 
to make things a little simple, the basic definition of high tech is that these are industries where uh, the R&D intensity is 5% or more. What, uh, what does R&D intensity mean? R&D intensity means that if in a sector or uh, in uh, an industry, the companies or organizations within that industry are spending more than 5% of their uh, existing budget uh, on research and development activities, then such a sector or industry will be called a high tech industry. And any innovation which takes place in such an industry will be called high tech innovation. Same is the case with an organization or company also. If a company or organization spends uh, more than 5% of its total budget of R&D activity, and by more than 5%, it can be anything. It can be 6%, it can be uh, 10%, it can be 20%, it depends. But as long as it is above the minimum 5% level, we will call that organization or company high tech as well. Uh, moving further, what is low technology innovation? This is another model of innovation. Uh, deriving from the same concept of high tech, low technology innovations are those innovations which take place inside industries or sectors where the R&D intensity is less than 5%. And you can see it here, the definition also. So R&D uh, intensity with less than 5% means that there are many industries or sectors which have zero R&D intensity, which means that there is zero focus on research and development. For example, if you look at developing countries like Pakistan, many industries in Pakistan are zero R&D uh, intensive or they, they, they have negligible amount spent on research and development. For example, if you look at the furniture industry in Pakistan, these are different uh, companies are producing furniture. So uh, there's not much research uh, going on as such all many companies what they are doing is they are you know copying different designs even small scale furniture manufacturers carpenters they simply copy designs so they do not have their own research and development focus similarly if you look at pakistan's textile industry if you look at pakistan or any developing countries leather industry if you look at our sports industry if you look at the uh, other industries uh, for example uh, which are manufacturing any kinds of goods, uh, you will find that there is zero or negligible research and development. And as a result, all such sectors are called low technology innovation sectors and innovations which take place in such sectors are called low tech. What it means is that innovations in such sectors are not technology driven, but they are driven by other factors uh, within the industry or organizations. What is important to remember is that there is a misconception amongst some analysts or some uh, people that for an economy to grow, uh, there has to be an investment into the high technology sectors or for high technology innovation. This is actually not true. Uh, data suggests, uh, and there has been a lot of work on this, data suggests that even in the developed countries, not just developing countries, a significant uh, component of their economy is uh, low technology based. And as a result, if uh, economies have to grow, if economies have to improve, uh, it is very important that uh, such countries uh, or economies or governments in the, these countries do not focus only on high tech. They have to make sure that there is significant investment and effort and policy level work for the development and prosperity of low technology sector also, because as I mentioned, low technology contributes a much higher percentage to the GDP of any country. Moving further, there is uh, the, the model of network innovation. What is network innovation? Uh, this model uh, is based on this paradigm in which organizations formulate collaborative networks. This is, this is an important concept, the, the idea of collaborative networks. What does a collaborative network mean? A collaborative network means that uh, uh, this is an innovation in which different organizations or companies interact or you know come together uh, through formal relationships. Uh, formal relationships means that they 
they sign agreements amongst each other they uh, sign memorandums or uh, uh, other kinds of legal documents and they join together on a certain project for example designing a product but this this collaboration amongst different organizations is formalized through documentation and formal relationships so uh, if more than one organization joins hands with uh, joins uh, joins hands with uh, another organization or different organizations come together to collaborate on designing a new product or improving existing industry processes uh, we will call it network innovation a very simple example of network innovation is uh, the uh, uh, networks which are uh, uh, formulated uh, in different uh, uh, countries and regions amongst three specific entities uh, businesses or firms uh, universities or academic institutions and government organizations or agencies so there are many examples especially for example in the case of silicon valley in america california state uh, it's an example of a network innovation whereby private businesses or firms join hands with uh, different academic universities uh, because universities have uh, trained researchers uh, academicians who can you know conduct research or, and uh, this collaboration between uh, private sector businesses and uh, uh, different universities with the support of government organizations for example in the case of california the government support came in the form of the state government of california there are different universities in california for example uc berkeley and so on and so forth uh, and then there are software houses firms companies and, and you know technology firms so they joined together and developed innovations or products or processes and as a result such products or uh, processes resulting from this collaborative network are, is, are called network innovations. Uh, next, there's another very popular model of innovation, which is called open innovation. Now, open innovation, let me just take you through this uh, definition or idea first, and then I will try to explain how it is different from the uh, network innovation or other concepts. Uh, Open innovation, as it says, is a paradigm that assumes that firms can and should use external ideas as well as internal ideas and internal external paths to market as the firm looks or, or the firms look to advance their technology. It is the use of purposive inflows and outflows of knowledge to accelerate internal innovation and expand the markets for external use of innovation. Uh, very simply, I mean, the definition is long, but the basic idea is that open innovations are also somewhat similar to network innovations, but these are mainly characterized by uh, informal nature of the relationships. If you recall or remember, I just mentioned a while ago that for network innovations, the, the organizations, they join together and share their expertise in a formalized way. In open innovation, it's like uh, free for all sort of environment where any organization can access a solution or uh, acquire an idea from anywhere it wants. It doesn't have to have a formal uh, relationship with a firm. So uh, these are open innovations are characterized by different companies or organizations engaging in informal relationships. And these open innovations are also characterized by collaborations, not only amongst different organizations, in an informal way, but also collaborations within the organization. So that is why you see the word external and internal uh, in this uh, definition. Internal refers to within the organization and external refers to outside the organization. So open innovation is one considered to be one of the very popular uh, innovation paradigms. Uh, why is it popular? Because uh, research has suggested that open innovation based uh, models that are practiced by companies are much more efficient and they are uh, cost saving uh, and they also result in saving time. How they result in saving time? Sometimes uh, one organization may have an expertise in a specific area which the other organization does not have. So in if these other organization has to develop that capability, it will take, for example, six months or one year or two years. So they have to wait before they, you know, 
are able to uh, go for such uh, capability. So rather than waiting for six months to develop that capability, it is wise to you know get in touch or engage with that other organization which already has or possesses that capability or skill and save time and collaborate and you know come up with a product far quicker or faster. Open innovation especially is very much uh, need of the hour in the technology sectors. Why is it so? Because in technology based products, time is of the essence. As you all know, um, technology evolves very fast. And if an organization goes for network based models or tries to innovate and using its existing or internal resources only, it will take a lot of time. And uh, in a very competitive technology sector, you cannot wait indefinitely. And that is why open innovations allow the companies or firms or industries to come up with new ideas or updated technologies far quicker. So that is why open innovation is a uh, popular approach. In order to further emphasize why open innovation is such an important uh, dimension, there are some examples which are given in this handout and I will be requesting you to go through them. Uh, I will not go to the details of all these examples, but just to give you an idea, some of the major uh, companies of the world which practice open innovation. Uh, one is the General Electric. You can read about General Electric online. There's a lot of information. It is a very well, uh, well known, uh, established uh, company that deals with different kinds of appliances and technology products. So, for example, they have an open innovation manifesto I and mean, you can read about it further and this is sort of the company's uh, uh, you can say formal uh, approach towards open innovation and they practice this uh, regularly and they have these informal relationships with other different businesses organizations companies and they engage with them so they exchange knowledge they exchange ideas they exchange technologies they exchange human resources they exchange uh, uh, other resources uh, financial resources in such a way that they are able to develop products innovative products innovative processes far quicker and faster and there are many examples of this similarly nasa uh, as you all know, is also an organization which uh, invests uh, in open innovation approach. It has, for example, entered into relationships with uh, leading universities and uh, schools of the world, for example, Harvard Business School, London Business School, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of information given in terms of how NASA tries to practice open innovation. Again, because it's a technology-based uh, work that they, they have, so uh, innovation, open innovation is an important uh, aspect of their business or of, uh, management. Moving further, even companies which are non-technology apparently, they also engage in open innovation. For example, Coca-Cola, uh, where it says Coca-Cola Accelerator Program, this is an example of their open innovation approach, and you can read about it a little further. There are many examples where Coca-Cola has engaged with their customers or consumers to come up with new uh, ways of, you know, providing their product. For example, uh, this uh, Coca-Cola freestyle machine and mobile app. Uh, you can check up on this. So this is an example of the company engaging with its stakeholders, especially its consumers in an open environment, using open innovation practices to come up with new ideas for their business and for their products. Another example is that of Lego. Um, so you can read about Lego as well. Lego is also a company which has focused on uh, open innovation. Lego is a maker of these products, as you can see here. Some of you might be able to uh, recall from your uh, childhood days. Uh, so again, because Lego has to constantly come up with new designs and new products, and they have to constantly, you know, uh, try and capture a highly competitive market. And especially Lego has been struggling since uh, these technology devices have come up. So children and teenagers are not as much, you know, uh, willing to buy physical toys in the sense that the trend for toy purchase has reduced. So Lego has to 
really struggle to uh, survive in such a market. So they engage with their customers for different new product designs uh, through open innovation practices. Uh, another example is that of Samsung. And most of these mobile phone companies, even the Chinese phone, phones that you have, these are all based on open innovation. So for example, a mobile phone has a number of different components. It has a software component, it has operating system, it has so many apps, it has a hardware component. You know, within the hardware, there are so many different uh, uh, equipments which are installed in a mobile phone. So all these different hardware and software related components, they cannot be manufactured or you know developed by a single company internally or through its own resources. For example, if you look at the uh, the uh, digital sensor, for example, if you look at the uh, mobile's uh, finger uh, recognition system, uh, and if you find this in an Oppo mobile or if you find this in a Samsung mobile, it is very likely that Samsung has not developed it internally. It is very likely that they might have purchased or you know, gotten this idea uh, or you know, uh, develop this uh, finger rec uh, the, the recognition system uh, or face recognition technology uh, by taking help from another company. So, uh, uh, mobile phones are you know experiencing changes very fast, and with new models are coming. So, if the companies such as Samsung do not engage in open innovation, they will not be able to churn out or come out with new designs and improved products as fast as they would like to. So again, uh, this is a, an important uh, aspect. And then again, uh, here it says uh, that Samsung has opened its open innovation center. So, you know, this open innovation center has different teams who are working on different projects and developing different kinds of products for use in Samsung phones. So there's a lot of work going on as far as open innovation is concerned, even within Samsung and other technology companies. So, these are some examples that I wanted to share. Uh, with this, uh, uh, I'm concluding the first part of the lecture associated with innovation models. Please remember that there are many other innovation models as well. And if you access online materials or books on innovation management, you will come across other examples of innovation models. For example, there is the concept of ar architectural innovation, which is also an innovation model. There's another example or model which is called uh, archetype innovation and so on and so forth. So the list goes on, but these models that I refer to are some of the major ones. Moving to the next handout. Uh, now I will be looking at the concept of um, innovation from the perspective of, uh, especially the innovation model from the perspective of CPEC. Now, as I was reviewing these innovation models, uh, incremental innovation, radical innovation, uh, network innovation, open innovation, etc., there's another uh, innovation model, which is uh, called the systems of innovation or innovation system model. Uh, system of innovation or innovation system model uh, is derived from the systems theory and again um, one has to you know read up on systems theory uh, in detail to be able to understand what is the innovation system model so i'm not going to go into the detail of that but the systems theory or the systems of innovation model uh, it proposes uh, that uh, innovation takes place within a system-based framework uh, and in this regard uh, it uh, the systems approach comes up with two or three very uh, basic formats of the innovation models. The first one is the national innovation system. There's another one which is called the regional innovation system. And the third component of the innovation system or type of innovation model is the sectoral uh, innovation system. And there are many other examples as well. So deriving from the national innovation system, uh, model, uh, this handout that is in front of you, and I have shared a copy with you as well, is trying to provide a perspective on how we can understand CPEC uh, for Pakistan, from Pakistan's perspective. That is, that if Pakistan 
has to derive the true benefits of CPEC, one possible way to move ahead is using the national innovation system approach or model. Uh, so let me just go through this uh, handout. The national innovation system, if you look at this first paragraph, what is the national innovation system? It is the flow of technology and information among people, enterprises, and institutions, which is key to the innovative process on the national level. You can say that the innovation system approach is somewhat similar to the network approach or the open innovation approach. But when we say national innovation system, we are talking about the large scale uh, dimension of innovation. When I was discussing network innovation or open innovation, I remained focused on one company or one industry or sector. But when we say innovation system, that incorporates not just one company or one industry, but you know, multiple industries, multiple companies uh, at the level of at the, at the level of a country. And if you look at the overall uh, country level innovation model, then national innovation system is the relevant model or approach. So as far as Pakistan's national innovation system is concerned, if we want to conceptualize it or understand it, what we can say that Pakistan's national innovation system will consist of uh, multiple types of organizations, for example, and from multiple industries, but different kinds of people at the level of the government, in the private sector, uh, in the non-profit sector, in the education sector, in the health sector, uh, in the trade and commerce sector, uh, manufacturing sector, and so many other dimensions, services sector. So you, you bring in people and organizations, enterprises, institutions from all these facets, and then you look at them collectively. This is called the national innovation system. The re concept of system is that it is characterized by complexity because when you bring in 20, 30, 40, 100 organizations and include them in a national innovation system, these organizations have interactions, relationships, conflicts, disagreements, lack of cooperation, cooperation, and this results in a huge complex phenomena. And this complex uh, dimension of relationships, interactions uh, amongst, you know, sometimes hundreds of organizations or thousands of organizations, this is called the national innovation system. So for CPEC, because it's a national level project for Pakistan, it also has strategic implications even beyond Pakistan. It is uh, important that we look at CPEC from different approaches to help understand it better. So one of the approaches is the national innovation system. And uh, using this model or diagram, uh, I'm going to try and explain this. Uh, this model on national innovation system uh, has been proposed by Stephen Feinson. His name is given here. This was originally proposed in 2003. I must point out that as far as the national innovation system as, a, as an innovation model is concerned, there are various other frameworks or models of the same national innovation system. For example, this is one diagram, uh, which is uh, Stephen's view, but you, you can have other authors, other people who can have or who have provided their own understanding of how to approach a, a national innovation system. So if we follow this particular model and try to connect with the CPEC, what this model is telling us is that uh, as far as the, the performance of Pakistan, if you look at the bottom of this diagram, it says country performance here. So as far as the performance of Pakistan on innovation and economic growth is concerned, uh, its creation of jobs and you know, economic competitiveness, if the country has to perform better in terms of its economic growth, jobs, and competitiveness, using the CPEC as the bedrock or the foundation of our future uh, strategies for economic growth, if that is the case, we can look at uh, Pakistan through this particular model as a national innovation system. So according to this model, the 
national innovation system of a country such as pakistan consists of a few dimensions or characteristics which have to be understood and these dimensions are then connected through these arrow lines uh, which suggests which suggests direction or collaboration or interactions or relationships so for example if a country such as pakistan has to truly derive benefit from the cpac one dimension that they have to focus on is the macroeconomic and regulatory context for example what kind of uh, laws regulations exist inside pakistan what kind of international laws for trade commerce exist outside pakistan how pakistan develops and implements these regulatory requirements or laws or procedures within the country and how it tries to uh, take advantage of the external scenario for example uh, very recently in the news you have been watching the issue of fatf uh, fatf where pakistan's case has been under review so this this scenario of how pakistan deals with this um, fatf and whether it is able to successfully manage the uh, requirements or restrictions placed under the fatf regime this is very important because it will influence pakistan's ability to operate uh, successfully as, as an economy so when we say macroeconomic and regulatory context one example uh, is the fatf regulation similarly within the country different kinds of rules regulations laws exist for example the role of secp securities and exchange commission it is it is uh, a regulatory body uh, so it regulates or it has a say or influence in terms of how businesses and organizations and industries work so if we create uh, if 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 pakistan and the government of pakistan does not create a, a conducive macroeconomic and regulatory environment for businesses they 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 will not be able to function properly or the investors will not come and invest second dimension is communication infrastructure so if a com- when, when you look at a country's national innovation system one other dimension is the communication infrastructure that is why you are hearing news about different kinds of uh, construction projects for example road network railway network uh, this this and also the optic fibers the internet based uh, connectivity all this is part of the communication infrastructure so for example if cpac has to succeed the pakistan pakistan and china have to invest in this communication infrastructure because if you if you uh, uh, want to encourage industrialization if you want to encourage uh, manufacturing if you want to encourage businesses to come and invest obviously businesses cannot invest without a sound stable communication infrastructure if you establish a manufacturing plant in any part of the country for example in an industrial state or economic zone obviously that organization or manufacturing unit will need strong communication infrastructure for example they will need easy access to good quality roads for transportation of materials raw materials products etc they will need excellent uh, communication network in terms of you know uh, rail based network railway so that you know transportation can take place uh, in a cost effective manner in an efficient manner similarly communication infrastructure is the same thing whereby you need strong internet connectivity uh, to be able to you know communicate with the world and so on so forth so these are this is the second dimension another dimension is the education and training system on the left side of the diagram so for example as far as cpec is concerned this third dimension of pakistan national innovation system is associated with supply of trained human resources uh, any economy it, if it has to succeed or if it, if it has to flourish it needs good uh, trained uh, human resource uh, it's the people who matter at the end so you can have a very big building for an organization you can have excellent campus you can have an excellent manufacturing plant you can install the best machinery or equipment but if you do not have the right people with the right kind of skill uh, it will not work so this third dimension of national innovation system is that the the country has to have a strong emphasis on education and training system so 
strong emphasis on universities, research within these universities, training institutes, vocational training, skill transfer, uh, and other aspects, incubation centers, uh, entrepreneurship, enterprises, all this dimension, these are associated with education and training system. The fourth dimension is the product market conditions. Okay, so product market conditions refers to that any in any country, when products are manufactured in any sector or industry, uh, uh, where where are the avenues or opportunities for selling these products or marketing these products? For example, if uh, uh, in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, uh, there is manufacturing of uh, charsada chapels or uh, the chapli that we have. So if it is manufactured in charsada or in other parts of the Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province, uh, where it is manufactured and where it is sold, what kind of avenues or opportunities are available where these products can be sold? How much of a conducive environment is available whereby these products which are manufactured in Charsada or adjoining areas or other parts of the province, what opportunities are provided that they can export these products, they can reach out to international markets, they can reach out to national level markets. For example, if a product is manufactured in Peshawar, how easy it is to be able to sell it in Karachi or Lahore or how difficult it is, how easy it is or how uh, difficult it is to to market and sell it outside Pakistan, for example, in the UAE or Europe or Americas or other parts of the world. So that is what we mean by product market conditions, that what kind of conditions have been created or what kind of environment and facilities and opportunities have been provided within the country so that when a product is uh, uh, manufactured or is ready, uh, how easy and how quick it is to sell it and generate profits and revenues for yourself. Uh, next dimension is factor market conditions. So factor market conditions refers to the inputs for a product. So for example, how easy it is to access raw materials for a product, how easy it is to and how cheap it is to acquire raw materials of these are because these are this is connected with the factors of production concept. So all the inputs or raw materials needed, what, where, which markets are going to supply these, or which markets have these inputs or raw materials? How easy it is to access them? How, or otherwise, how difficult it is? These are called the factor market conditions. Obviously, the more a government and its uh, institutions or its departments make these factor uh, factors easy to access the more it will be easy for the uh, business organization to manufacture or develop these products using easy to access raw materials, cheap raw materials, good quality raw materials. So obviously it will result in good products as well. So the fifth dimension to this model is a focus on improving the factor market conditions. And using these five dimensions, then there are other factors, for example, the uh, the global innovation network there are other examples of you know uh, clusters of industries i am not going to go into the details of that because it's a very complex uh, model but uh, all these five factors and some of the other components that you see inside the main the, the central part of the circle these all these and the interaction and complex relationships amongst these different uh, components of the model, they result in national innovation capacity. And the, the higher or the stronger the national innovation capacity of a country, the better will be the country's performance It's in terms of its economic growth, in terms of job creation, in terms of its competitiveness at the national and international level. So uh, if, if CPAC has to uh, bring in true benefits for Pakistan, it, it is a challenge for the government and its uh, constituent bodies. It is a challenge for all different institutions, businesses, all sectors of the economy that they collaborate and join together and emphasize or focus on these five key factors, improvement of these five key factors, along with some of the internal dimensions to this diagram, which are mentioned here in the central part of the circle. So with this, I come to the end of the 
second handout. Finally, before I conclude, I'm just going to quickly uh, go through a review of the National Science, Technology, and Innovation Policy. And this is a handout that I have shared with you. Um, uh, please remember that you are not required to read this uh, 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 document completely. It is about 78 pages. And by the way, this is a document from 2012. So obviously, <laughs> this uh, policy is uh, not really relevant as such. The purpose of sharing it uh, with you is to give you a sense of how uh, Pakistan uh, is approaching its uh, science, technology, innovation. Um, and at the level of the government, uh, how they are conceptualizing uh, science, technology, and innovation. Because if we talk about national innovation system, if we talk about CPEC, uh, one, one way to look at it is through this lens of uh, innovation policy. So only for that purpose, I'm sharing this document with you. Uh, and again, like I said, no need to read all of it, but there are some important points that I want to make before I conclude. Uh, if you look at the contents of this, it will give you some ideas to the basic uh, thought behind this policy. So the, the document starts with introduction. It gives the vision and objectives of Pakistan's science, technology, and innovation policy. Uh, then it goes on to highlight some of the key dimensions of the uh, uh, the national innovation system, where 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 the policy is guiding the government and its constituent ministries and its constituent departments to to focus on. So, for example, uh, one dimension to this policy is the science, technology, and innovation planning and management structure. So what it means is that in order for this policy to be implemented, the policy itself recommends that there will be a national commission for science and technology based in Islamabad at the federal level. Then there has to be the role of the Ministry of Science and Technology. Then there has to be a role of Pakistan Council for Science and Technology. And then under that, come the provincial departments of science and technology. For example, in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, there's a department for science and technology. You can check on the uh, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa government's website. Different departments are given, and you will come across science and technology as well. So starting from the federal level at the, at the top, which is the National Commission for Science and Technology, and then it has different layers. And then uh, the policy uh, tries to explain the role of the all these different layers up till the provincial departments of science and technology. Second dimension of this policy is that it focuses on human resources, that is uh, how to develop and provide human resources for science, technology, innovation across different parts of the economy and different sectors and industry. So there are specific policy guidelines for education and training, uh, uh, in-service training, technical and vocational education, non-formal education and training. Then there is a focus of this policy on service condition and incentives for scientific and technical manpower. For example, how to encourage research, how to encourage universities and other uh, sectors to you know, uh, spend time and effort on research and developing new ideas and technologies, what motivational measures will be taken, and so on. So how science will be popularized so that uh, the human resources uh, take part or, or contribute to uh, science, technology, and innovation. Third dimension of this policy is the focus on indigenous technology development, localized development of technology. Rather than borrowing technology from outside, it is trying to emphasize on the, the, the uh, capability or developing a capability where Pakistan has uh, the capacity to develop technologies internally. So there's a sector, a section on high technology, incentives for developing technology, and so many other dimensions. There is a section on innovation fund, which is meant to you know, provide uh, financial resources or funding for uh, technology development, and so on and so forth. Next dimension of this policy is 
technology transfer and the creation of absorptive capacity. So, for example, in this section of the policy document, the policy tries to emphasize on those uh, strategies or those uh, initiatives where uh, organizations will be enabled to uh, transfer technology. For example, how one uh, company or one sector if it has, it has developed a certain specific technology, how it can transfer that to other sectors, how it can collaborate. So again, this connects with our concept of network innovation and open innovation. Also, this creation of absorptive capacity. So what is absorptive capacity? Absorptive capacity is the ability of a firm or a company or an industry to uh, assimilate or absorb a new technology or, a, or something new. How quick it is to accept this new technology and how quick it is to learn and adapt that technology uh, that is called the absorptive capacity so it's a very important innovation concept that companies or industries which have high absorptive capacity they are faster in terms of uh, uh, adapting technologies and they respond far quicker to uh, technological changes on the for example in the case of chinese companies uh, they have one of the key strengths of chinese firms has been that they have very strong absorptive capacity. They can adopt technology from outside very fast. For example, referring back to my example of the mobile phones or any other technology device, why is it that Chinese are able to develop uh, a, a replica or a similar product uh, very quickly? Because they have very strong absorptive capacities. So this section of the document focuses on technology transfer and absorptive capacity. Then. Uh, another dimension to this policy document is the internal cooperation, uh, how uh, different uh, sectors within the economy, different institutions within the economy and outside, uh, how they will cooperate with each other to improve science, technology and innovation scenario for Pakistan. Lastly, in this document, <coughs> uh, the document talks about specific sectors of Pakistan's economy where the policy will try to emphasize uh, on a greater role of science, technology, and innovation. So some of the thrust areas or sectors are connected with metro, uh, metrology, standard testing, because this standard testing and quality, MSTQ, that has to do with uh, quality management and production of quality products. So. Uh, the, the policy document is saying that the country will focus on MSTQ to enhance the uh, standard uh, quality standards of the products which are produced in Pakistan. Another dimension or thrust area is the focus on environment, especially green production, environmental friendly production, health and pharmaceutical. This is a sector that the policy is focusing on as far as science, technology, and innovation is concerned, energy sector, biotech, agriculture and livestock, water, minerals ocean resources, electronics, information and communication technologies, space, material science, nano science and nanotechnology, uh, lasers and photonics, engineering sector. So uh, these are the these are the different sectors uh, of Pakistan's economy, whereby the policy is emphasizing on specific actions, specific initiatives to improve science, technology, and innovation performance of these sectors, which will then eventually result in the, the uh, improvement in the uh, performance of the economy. Uh, uh, so this is just the background. It gives you a sense of how uh, the, the government tries to approach uh, any specific dimension of uh, their, their outlook for the country. So in this policy document, it gives us a sense of how the government perceives its its, its uh, science, technology, and innovation agenda. Obviously, because it's a 2012 document, so it might not be uh, relevant at this stage. But the idea is to give you a sense of how things are working. Finally, uh, I'm going to share a copy of this document. This is an updated version of the policy document that I discussed just a while ago. This is Science, Technology and Innovation Strategy 2014 and 18. It has been developed by Pakistan Council for Science and Technology under the Ministry of Science and Technology, Government of Pakistan. So I'll be sharing this through Google Classroom. Also, it has 
more or less similar kind of information as the innovation policy that I reviewed just a while ago. If you have the time and you would like to learn a little bit further in terms of how the government is approaching this whole idea of national innovation system or innovation and how it is looking at or what is its model of innovation and science and technology. So these documents can give you some idea. Also, I would strongly encourage you to visit the website of the Ministry of Science and Technology and its uh, constituent departments, find out the, 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 the different kinds of policy documents, strategies, strategy documents which are uploaded to these websites. So that can also give you a very good idea of how uh, Pakistan and its uh, government and different organizations are approaching innovation and innovation process. So with that, I come to the end of my talk. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, I will be uploading this uh, lecture to the YouTube channel uh, and then get back to you during week 16, whereby we will conclude this uh, course because week 16 is the last week of the course. Thank you very much. Allah Hafiz.